Hi, Mark Donovan here from Falcon Imagery, and today I'm going to go over the topic of how to read a sectional aeronautical chart. Uh, these charts play an extremely important role uh, for VFR pilots when flying, and they're extremely important to understand for your check ride. If you're going for your private pilot's uh, license and you fail to understand how to read a sectional chart, you're going to be in trouble on your check ride. So I'm here today to kind of go over the uh, sectional aeronautical um, chart and show you the key areas that you really need to study on and be ready for for your check ride uh, but more importantly how to use the sectional to your benefit when you're flying so follow along all right let's get into it how to read a sectional aeronautical chart uh, if you have any questions or comments regarding the content of this video just feel free to leave uh, those questions or comments uh, below the description and i'll try to get to them as time permits so what is an faa sectional aeronautical chart well, first of all, the sectional aeronautical charts are the primary navigational reference medium used by the VFR pilot community. And as you can see in on the right-hand side in this picture, there's over 50 charts uh, or sectional charts that cover all of the continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. So you kind of have to figure out where you're living and pick the right sectional that's associated with the area that you're living or where you plan to be flying over. Uh, sectional charts have a scale of 1 to 500,000, or 1 inch equals 6.86 nautical miles. And again, they're designed for VFR, visual flight rule navigation, for slow to medium speed aircraft. So, uh, aircraft like general aviation aircraft, training aircraft like Skyhawks, Archers, Warriors, things like that. Uh, they are updated every 56 days, so they have a very short life lifespan. And it's important that uh, you don't fly around with expired uh, sectional charts in your aircraft um, unless you write uh, for expired not for navigational use and they're just for more situational awareness uh, but you don't want to be uh, flying around with a bunch of um, sectional charts in your aircraft that are expired so where can you obtain a sectional aeronautical chart well first of all you can purchase them from a number of resources you can purchase them from amazon.com sporty's pilot shop my pilot store or if you have a subscription to like ForeFlight and others, uh, they automatically include up-to-date current um, uh, sectional charts amongst other many other charts and, and items and features. But um, it can, if you purchase one of these types of um, electronic flight bags um, like ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot, um, you'll be able to get up-to-date sectional charts um, uh, as they become available. Um, you can also download for free from the FAA's website uh, sectional charts. The only problem with that is uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes difficult to utilize or re read them and know when they expire and so on and so forth. So um, there are, they are a free resource, though, so I might put them out there. Um, there are also a number of uh, online websites that have current, they just maintain current status on the sectional charts. They're like a mosaic all, all pulled together across all the continental U.S. or Hawaii or Alaska. Um, three in particular that I've used is Sky Vector, um, Air Nav, and VFR Map. So key items to review on a sectional chart. Um, first of all, you want to review the sectional chart legend. It's extremely important that you spend some time reviewing the legend and understanding um, what those items are and so that when you go to read the chart itself, uh, you'll have a clue of, of what you're looking at. So that's what we're going to do now, and the bulk of this, uh, this uh, video is on interpreting it, the symbol, uh, the symbology on a sectional chart. Uh, key items that you want to make sure that you can identify for a check ride or just your own needs for flying, uh, be able to identify the airport designators and the related airport information about those airports, the various type of airspace uh, that that's the uh, aircraft is flying over, um, the populated areas, um, antennas and towers, especially the really tall ones, they can be a, a problem. Um, alert areas, special use airspace, uh, Victor Airways, uh, GPS or T routes, and then of course uh, the identifying global positioning system coordinates for a particular spot on a sectional. So we're going to take a deeper dive into the um, half a dozen to seven um, major areas of interest on the legend associated with the sectional chart. Uh, that includes airport types, airport data, airport traffic and airspace information, communication boxes, radio aid navigation obstructions, 
miscellaneous topop topographic information, and then just uh, some other stuff. So we'll first get into the airports. And I think I want to first highlight, and I'm just going to put my, um, my pointer on, on laser pointer. It's important to understand you've got um, basically two different types of airports that you need to think about. The magenta colored airport symbols represent non-towered airports, and the blue um, symbols represent towered airports. The hollow circles represent something other than hard surface runways, such as gravel or grass. Um, hard surface runways that are 1,500 feet to 8,069 feet in length are um, represented by circles with the uh, depiction of the runway, the magnetic heading of the runway on, on the circle. And, and again, because it's solid, it's a hard surface area. Uh, larger runways, 8,069 feet um, and, and higher, um, they will have kind of rectangular shapes representing, again, the magnetic heading of the uh, runway. And if there's multiple runways, you can see here, they're, they're showing two different runways. Um, the open or the dot that you see in some cases uh, on some of the um, airport config depictions here represent VOR, DME, DME, or VORTAC services or, or, or navigation aids, ground-based aids, on the airport surface. Um, other types of symbology, the R inside a circle, this means it's a private airport. Uh, two concentric circles, either magenta or blue, represent mili uh, military airports. And then they've got a few other ones, like H for helicopter, U for unverified, um, if the airport's closed, an X across it, or an F for ultralight uh, flight park. Um, the little tick marks that you see around an airport, like what you see here, they represent that there's services there, such as fuel, maintenance, etc. The next major box is the airport data box, and there's a whole host of information in here, but I'm just going to highlight some of the more salient points here. Uh, the ICOA symbol for the airport name um, is here. Um, the weather, ATIS, AWOS, ASOS frequency is, is listed. Um, You'll see a CT for the control tower. Um, if there's a CTAF frequency, that will be listed as well. Um, the uh, field elevation above sea level, uh, the length of the runway or the longest runway, uh, Unicom frequency. Um, if there's a right pattern, it'll identify it um, in this area associated with the airport. Um, if there's no special VFR services, that will be identified. And again, there's a few other things, but those are the major points. Oh, um, the other thing I'll highlight is the L for lighting operation, sunset to sunrise, and if there's a star, it means pilot-controlled um, pilot lighting. If we move on down to the airport traffic service and airspace information, this is a strong, really key one to spend some time on. You've got to be able to identify the type of airspace uh, that you're potentially flying over. Um, you definitely need to know this solidly for your check ride. Um, I'll start here. What we have here is concentric blue circles around the city of Boston. This is class Bravo airspace. Here we have um, concentric uh, magenta solid lines uh, around the airport of Manchester um, Airport, and that's class Charlie. Uh, here we have the dashed uh, thick blue lines. Uh, this is class Delta airspace represented by that. And then we have uh, class echo to the surface represented by the thin magenta dashed line. And this is around the city of Concord, or Concord Airport. We'll get into more examples here at the end of this um, section. Um, but for now, that's, that's kind of the key points I want to uh, highlight on the airspace. Um, here you'll see this vignette, regions of vignette, and it goes from dark to light. Within the lighter area, on the, lighter side, on, the, on the light side of the vignette area, this represents class echo airspace down to 700 feet. And outside the vignette area, where, where it's uh, the area adjacent to the dark side of the vignette, this means class echo down to 1,200 feet AGL. And why, why do we need that? Why is that there? Well, if you were to look at this in this region here where there's 
700 feet AGL is where Class Echo goes down to. There's several airports in this region, all with instrument approaches. And basically, air traffic control wants to basically control that space or that um, airspace down to a lower level because of those instrument approaches. Um, a couple other points here. You'll notice off the coast of, in this case, the Northeast, uh, you have warning areas and ADIS areas, and we'll get into those in a, in a minute uh, in regards to what those are. Um, there's also some magenta hash lines up here. This represents military operating areas. And again, we'll spend a little bit more time on a later slide. The next box is the communication box and radio navigation aids. And, and you're going to see these, for example, near a VOR. Here's a VOR represented by the compass rose. Notice it's headed uh, its zero um, north position is the magnetic north, not the true north. Uh, and you'll see a box here. And the box here um, contains the VOR frequency um, so that you can dial it in and, and navigate to or from the VOR. And then this box, uh, the number above here represents um, the flight service um, station frequency that you could um, contact for um, getting information such as weather information. In some cases, as it's described here, you'll see a little R next to the number. This is another flight service station frequency, but what the R stands for, the flight service station will receive on that frequency um, so that if you wanted to transmit something to and talk to them, you could transmit on 122.1 and they'll receive it on 122.1 and then um, pick up a, your, your, they will transmit back to you, uh, audio-wise, voice, over the VOR frequency. Um, there's also some other information about um, the symbology of what VORs look like with DME, uh, with a Vortac, um, um, whether or not there's an NDB beacon or not um, associated um, on the map. So all that type of information is available um, through these comm boxes in Radio Nav Aid section in the, in, in the sectional. Another key one is uh, obstructions and basically towers and different types of towers, but it also could be wind turbines um, and, and other items, but those are the main ones, towers and wind turbines. And um, there's some examples that I show here, obstruction with high intensity lights, um, obstruction with high intensity lights here. Um, and basically the depiction of the, of the uh, obstruction delineates how tall it is or if it's got lighting capability on it or if there's clusters of, of antennas nearby, or if there's turbines. Uh, the next area is miscellaneous. Uh, this is really for mostly alert areas, and we're going to get into that um, special use space in a second. Uh, aerobatic uh, flying, glider activity, hang glider activity, ultralight activity, uh, unmanned drone activity, parachute jumping, uh, rocket launches, uh, stadiums, um, isogonic lines. All that type of information um, is contained in that box. Um, in addition, there is information about power lines, uh, aerial cables, and so on that could be a factor for safe flying. So I'll go over some sectional examples of the information provided on the sectional chart. Uh, this first one is a sea-based airport. It's denoted by the anchor um, in the center of the airport, and it's got some services on it by the tick marks identified. Uh, we have an isogonic line. Uh, this is a, a, one of the lines representing equal lines of magnetic variation. Um, it's used for VFR flying and navigational purposes. Um, and it's kind of a delineation between the true north and the magnetic north. And again, along this line, we have equal lines of magnetic variation. Um, the R um, enclosed by a circle is a private airfield. Uh, the Number two seven, this is a maximum elevation figure um, segment. Um, within the GPS coordinates in this segment, the maximum elevation figure is 2,700 feet. It's an important number when you're planning a cross-country flight or if you're flying over this region, you're probably going to want to fly about 1,000 feet minimum above the maximum elevation figure as you're traversing this segment to make sure you don't inadvertently hit something. Um, the yellow represents the populated area as you would see it at night. Uh, through the lights. Um, as I just highlighted here regarding the maximum elevation figure, you see these lines here, these vertical lines are the longitudinal axis lines, and the lines here represent the latitude lines. And with the lat and longitude lines, we can find any GPS um, position on the sectional chart. 
want to talk a little bit about uh, special use airspace. Um, it's airspace in which certain activities must be confined. It's identified in aeronautical charts, such as the sectional chart, with notes or contact information of the controlling agency. So in the back of any sectional, there'll be a section uh, on the bottom um, portion of it in white with the name of or the number associated with the type of special use airspace and a frequency or a phone number that you can reach out to uh, for the controlling agent to see to see if that particular special use airspace is active or if you have any specific questions regarding that space. Um, with special use airspace, basically it's limitations that are imposed on aircraft operations that are not part of those activities. Certain special use airspace areas can create limitations on mixed use. Uh, an example of that is here. This is uh, a military operating area uh, labeled as Yankee 1 and 2. Uh, basically, MOA is, represents separating um, military traffic from IFR traffic. It doesn't preclude VFR traffic from flying in it. Uh, but it's a wise idea to contact the controlling agency. In this particular case, it would be a Boston Approach and asking them, is, it, is the area hot or active if you're going to be traversing it on a VFR uh, flight? So types of special use airspace, we have prohibited areas, restricted areas, warning areas, military operating areas, alert areas, and controlled firing areas. So prohibited areas are air, um, aircraft flight prohibited. It's depicted as a P. Uh, with a number, basically you're not going to be allowed to fly there. Simple as that. Restricted areas, operations are hazardous to non-participating aircraft and contains airspace within which the flight of aircraft, while not wholly prohibited, is subject to restriction, designated by R followed by a number. So if there's a restricted area, you'd have to contact the controlling agency and see what the restrictions are, see if there's any issue with you flying through that space. Warning areas. They're similar to restricted areas. However, the United States government doesn't have sole jurisdiction over the airspace. Airspace of defined dimensions extending from three nautical miles outward from the coast of the United States containing activity that may be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. Uh, it may be located over domestic or international waters or a combination of both. And warning areas are depicted by a W followed by a number. Uh, military operating areas, which I highlighted earlier, um, which are represented by the magenta hash lines. Um, they are used for military aircraft uh, to help maintain the proficiency of tactical uh, flying. Routes usually established below 10,000 feet MSL for operations at speeds greater than 250 knots. Uh, routes are identified as either IFR or IR or VFR, VR, followed by a number. Uh, so VR 123 is a visual flight rule flight. It could be flown from 1,500 feet AGL or below treetop level. So airspace within defined vertical and lateral limits established for the purpose of separating, again, military traffic from IFR traffic. Again, it doesn't preclude VFR traffic flying in there, but uh, you definitely want to know if it's hot if you're going to go into that area. And again, it's depicted in the aeronautical charts by those magenta hash lines. Alert areas are depicted in aeronautical charts with an A followed by a number, and this is for um, informing non-participating pilots of areas of activity, high volume activity, such as pilot training or unmanned drone flying. Uh, glider activity, et cetera. And then there's controlled firing areas, which really aren't showed in the sectional charts, but they contain activities that have not conducted in a controlled environment could be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. Um, air defense identification zones, land and water-based and need for defense VFR flight plans to operate VFR in this airspace. So off your coast, uh, uh, the United States or up near the borders, Canada, Mexico, you would need to fly with an um, a defense VFR flight plan. Uh, flight restricted zones. In the vicinity of the Capitol White House, uh, you're not going to be able to fly there, uh, whether you're a remote pilot or a manned pilot. Um, wildlife areas, wilderness areas, national parks, you're not allowed to take off or land in these areas and must stay 2,000 feet above ground level above them when flying over them. And similarly with National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Marine Areas, NOAAs, uh, you've got to fly no less than 200 feet, 2,000 feet AGL above them when flying over them. The other thing to just be wary of, tethered balloons. Tethered balloons can go up to 60,000 feet on a cable. So definitely want to know if there's any tethered balloon active in your area. And another main reason why when you want to call for a, a weather brief or get a weather brief uh, to make sure there's no TFRs or any other types of nodems out there that could affect you, such as a tethered balloon. 
So again, the special use airspace examples, I'll give you a few. There's that military operator area up in the Yankee uh, MOA. Um, there's a prohibited area. This happens to be the Bush Estate property off the coast of uh, Kenny Bunk, Port, Maine. Um, there's a warning area labeled by the W-103. There's an ADIS area, again, showing off the coast. And then there's a little parachute there as an alert area for parachute jumping. And I think the last slide here is global positioning system. Again, um, each sectional chart has these grid lines for representing longitude and latitude lines, um, as you can see there on the map of the globe. And then with the numbers uh, displayed on the sectional chart, you can basically go and identify any particular location with a set of GPS coordinates. So now I'm going to just uh, look at skyvector.com and show you a few spots in here uh, that you want to think about in terms of airspace. Um, I think first I want to talk about Laconia Airport, uh, which is where I fly out of. This airport is in class golf or G airspace. Again, you see the vignette, vignette line, thick vignette line here. And within this area, class echo goes down to 700 feet. So it's class golf to the surface, class echo starts at 700 feet. Outside of the vignette line, represented by the darker side here, uh, class echo goes down to 1,200 feet, and below that it's class golf. And you can see in this example here, all this vignette area inside here is basically echo to the ground unless there's an airport there. Here's a class delta airport, airport Lebanon, with a class echo to the ground. And this is probably associated with an instrument approach into there. And um, they wanted uh, air traffic control, wanted control of that airspace, not just down to 700 feet, but all the way down to um, the ground um, as aircraft approached into Lebanon Airport. Similarly, down in Concord, you see the vignettes. So it's 700 feet to, um, um, to the below 700 feet, it's it's class golf up to 700 feet. That's where class echo starts. However, all around Concord, you see this magenta line. This means class echo all the way to the ground. Um, here is Manchester Airport. Uh, you'll notice here just how in terms of reading this, you see surface to 4,300 feet um, is MSL is the uh, the top of the class Charlie airspace. There are some shelves out here, starting at 2,500 feet, going to 4,300, 2,000 to 4,300. You do see some class echo to the ground here. Um, the notice of field elevation is 266 feet high. Uh, they rounded up to 300 and added another 4,000 feet because you typically class Charlie airspace goes up to 4,000 feet above the surface of the airport. So with a, roughly a 300, 300 foot MSL, Field elevation, add the 4,000. That's where they come up with the 4,300. Um, going down here, this is a prime example, which I mentioned earlier, of a VOR. This is the Gardner VOR. And the VOR frequency dialing in is 116.9. But you'll notice here, 122.1. This is the, uh, um, the frequency uh, that you would transmit on to contact flight service station. Uh, for Bridgeport, and they would receive it on 122.1. But if they're going to communicate back to you, let's say with weather information, they would communicate over the VOR frequency of 116.9. So you'd listen on your VOR um, for 116.9, and you would transmit on your um, comm radio on 122.R to communicate to the Gardner um, Flight Service Station. Over here we have Boston, concentric circles. Uh, it goes up to 7,000 feet um, MSL and, and to the surface here in the center, and then you see various shelves out here. Here we have a mode C or an ADSB out veil. Uh, basically, if you're coming down from the north or any direction from the west, um, you need to make sure you've got your transponder on, uh, mode C transponder on, and have ADSB out going uh, to go any further into here. I'm not going to get into all the uh, communication requirements um, in, in establishing uh, clearance to get into Bravo and stuff like that. I'm really just trying to highlight some of the key features um, that it can be seen on a sectional chart. Um, coming up here, again, here's isogonic line that I mentioned earlier. It's running 15 degrees west. 
Um, the light area represents how this um, city would look just north of Auburn Lewiston Airport um, from the air at night. Again, out here we have our eight is um, space. We have our warning areas. Uh, one thing I should mention here are um, these blue lines coming into uh, the VOR. These are GPS um, T routes. Um, in other cases, you would see them as Victor Airways, but basically for GPS navigation, um, traffic would fly along these, these T routes to, to uh, the Concord VOR. Um, if we were to go out further, maybe I can find one down here somewhere else. Um, again, T routes there. Many of the, the Victor Airways have been replaced by T routes. Yep, here we go. Um, here's a Victor Airway V292. Basically meaning traffic can go as low as 1,200 feet AGL up to 18,000 feet uh, MSL. Um, and so if an aircraft flying on a VFR, maybe an IFR flight plan may be flying along one of these Victor Airways. Um, another thing I want to highlight here is uh, maximum elevation figures. Um, come back up to this region. So if you see this maximum elevation figure of 46, this means there's a maximum elevation figure of roughly 4,600 feet. And what I see right here is a mountain top of 4,200. They've rounded up. So if you're going to be traversing this area, uh, it's not a bad idea to fly about 1,000 feet above that minimum. But on the appropriate altitude, if you're flying VFR, um, if you're flying from a 0 to 179 heading, it's going to be odd plus 500. Um, if you're flying um, toward the 180 to 360 um, direction, you're going to fly an even plus 500. So bottom line is you plan a cross-country flight, look at these um, maximum elevation figures that you're going to be traversing, find the tallest one or highest one, and then add the appropriate altitude that gives you at least 1,000 foot separation um, from the maximum elevation figure and complies with the 500 feet and the right direction depending which way you're traveling. So those are the salient points in how to read a sectional aeronautical chart. I highly suggest you take time to review the legend, um, memorize the legend if you can, and then just practice reading various uh, points on a sectional to make sure that you can clearly identify any type of airspace or item, special use airspace, etc., on the sectional chart. It'll definitely help you dramatically for your check ride and will also help you when you're flying for real uh, VFR flying uh, going forward in your pilot career. Um, I will make one final comment. You'll notice on this sectional here, it says expired, not for navigational use. Again, these sectional charts expire every 56 days. So you don't want to have these sitting in your aircraft uh, without some type of expiration uh, writing on it if they're old sectionals. If they are found to be in your aircraft, and it appears that you may be using them and they're not labeled as not for navigation purposes, you may have a problem. So highly recommend once they expire, if you're going to keep them on your possession or in the plane, put it not for navigation use expired so that if any FAA person um, sees them in your possession, they'll know that you're not attempting to navigate uh, flight uh, using an expired sectional chart. Anyways, I hope you found this video useful. If you did, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you get notified on my next video.